Hello, hello, fearless listeners. Are you ready for another episode of Let Fear Bounce? It's the podcast that's all about conquering challenges and facing our fears. I'm your host, Kim Langling, and each week we'll dive into inspiring stories, expert insights, and practical tips to help you turn your fear into your greatest ally. So sit back, relax, grab that cup of coffee, and let's discover how to make fear our bouncing board towards a life filled with endless possibilities right here on Let Fear Bounce. Have you asked yourself who's going to take care of your pet should something happen to you? Well, I've got an answer for you. The Do-It-Yourself Pet Estate Will Kit that gives you peace of mind that your family pet will be cared for when you are no longer physically able to care for them. With easy step-by-step instructions that guide you through the task of completing forms necessary to add your furry loved one to your existing will. Visit KimLanglingAuthor.com to find out more. Hello, hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Let Fear Bounce. This is Kim Langling, your host, and I am so happy that you are spending just a small part of your day with myself and my special guest today, Walker Brandt. Now, she's an actress. She's also appeared in international blockbuster films, television shows, and thousands of advertising campaigns and commercials for global brands. But dot, dot, dot. What most didn't know about Walker or don't know about Walker until her book, Awaken, Discovering Yourself Through the Light of Your Innocence was released, is her unique story and the choices that she made at a young age to overcome the trauma of her youth and the anxiety that it caused. Awaken was written to assist others in consciously creating a movement internally of happiness and success through choosing to grow and committing to expand beyond the bondage of past circumstances. Now, if that doesn't catch your interest, folks, I don't know what would. So Walker, welcome to Let Fear Bounce. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm excited about this conversation with you, Kim. <laughs> well, I, you know, I, <laughs> you've got a, you've got a, a fun little background going on here, don't you? Um, <laughs> So, you know, you're, you're an actress and have been doing so for quite some time. You've been in movies that we could all name and that we've probably all seen. So, Hey, congratulations on all of that. Anyway, I think that's awesome. Thank you. Thank you. It's been a fun and interesting. I feel like I've had several lives. (laughs) I I bet. I bet. But you know, what a, what a fun thing to be able to say that you found success in that realm and you're still, you're, you're opening up that door and stepping into that door again of acting and, and to new, uh, new things that you're going to be doing. So good luck with all of that. That's, that's actually super exciting stuff. Thank you. Thank you. I'm excited. Yeah. The pandemic put an interesting spin on things and, uh, yeah, I'm excited that, um, I think we've all kind of been in a self-created chrysalis at, you know, of our, our own without realizing it, maybe some of us didn't realize we did it, but we needed to go in and grow and um, reevaluate and find out where we're, where we want to go from this strange globally uniting event. Globally uniting. That's an interesting way to put it because it truly is. And what? Yeah, it was. And I'm, you know, my, my life completely turned around on a dime from the pandemic. I I was not doing podcasting and all of this prior to that. I was working a nine to five outside the home, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, So my life completely changed just, you know, just like that. And it was, I like how you, you referenced that we were all, you know, in a chrysalis and that, you know, what a, what a cool mental picture to bring, at least it does to my mind. Because I have talked to so many folks over the last three years, how their lives have, they're, they're nothing like they were four years ago. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you take that time to, to look at what you want, who you are, what you're good at, what are your passions? And then you think, gosh, why don't I do that? Exactly. Exactly. You know, it's interesting because when life is, you know, when we're being done by life and we're not being ourselves and our truth and not doing life, 
from a, as a result of being who we are, th that's what happens. Something, you know, and what I mean by that is when something like the pandemic happens, it puts us in a place by force where we have to go inside. And so I, I have this, this nature about me. I always look at the positive, even when I'm, you know, even I remember back when I was a kid going through the worst of, of the abuse that I, that I lived through, I still went out in nature. I still found a way to find the silver lining, to find something that made me feel like I mattered and that I was connected to something that made sense because the chaos in my family didn't make sense to me. You know, even though it impressed upon me and I'm not saying I didn't, you know, go out into the world and have some of that chaos in me. I certainly did. But I, I had my own desire to choose and to not just be a product of my environment. And I thank God for that because it really gave me a strong sort of life DNA through line of whatever happens, there's something positive here. And all the people I've spoken to in the last several years, what I, you know, when that, that visual came to me, a self-created chrysalis, that's what I kept seeing people. And because we've all kind of come out of it as this new butterfly with this new experience and new colors. And we're all kind of flying in a new way. It's, you know, it's a level of flying. Some of us are soaring. Some of us are feeling our wings and figuring it out. Like, oh, I can fly. I didn't know I had this in me. I didn't know I could do this. And that I think is really beautiful because we're, we're constantly evolving, right? Oh, I couldn't agree more. And you know, I love, I love the whole analogy in this picture that you're painting with your words. I I'm a very visual person. And as an author myself, I find inspiration from nature. Yesterday, there was an absolutely beautiful monarch mm. erratically flying in my backyard, just, you know, all over the place. No, it, no rhyme or reason for what it was doing. And I was thinking, oh, you sweet thing. You must have just gotten your wings. You're just finding your wings. And I was enthralled watching the erratic flight of that absolutely stunning butterfly. And as you were talking, that came to mind. And it is, it's, it's, we can attribute, we can attribute that type of mental image to so many folks through the last several years. Yeah. Now, yeah. when, when was your book released, Awaken? Well, it was originally going to be released in 2021, but then the pandemic happened. So I called my editor and I said, we need to do this now. So it was released in March of 2020. It was like a speed train. <laughs> We're like, okay, <laughs> let's get this done. There was, there was so much more I wanted to put in it, but it was like, okay, look, I'm just going to get this out. It's not going to be the only one. I want to get this out. It's my first and uh, and Lisa Nichols is who motivated me to write the book. I don't know if you know who she is, but yes. she's an amazing motivational speaker. She's and, a powerhouse. She's oh a powerhouse. my gosh, <laughs> she is a powerhouse. Just I love her. She's amazing, and she um she said a very powerful statement. And I can't really talk about how my book came about without bringing this up. She said your your story doesn't belong to you; it belongs to the person it can help. And for me, that was, oh gosh, that was like a gut punch in many ways because my story, I had kept so well packaged and hidden for so long uh, because I felt like I, that's what I had to do to create success. I didn't realize that in doing that, there were parts of my life where as a woman, as a human, I wasn't being my truth. I was being done by it. And in other parts of my life, I was being my truth, thankfully, what I had discovered in nature, how I grew, the choices I made, choosing myself and not the experiences I lived through. That was being my truth. But when I was being done by my truth, that was me resisting 
the reality of where I came from, what I lived through, the things that made me feel shame, unworthiness, lack, pain, pain fear. Oh gosh, the, the, the amount of times I had to hold fear in my hand and say, screw it. <laughs> Yeah, the other and go for it. Right. You know, to be blunt, you know, I love Lisa says it much more um, delicately. She says, hold your fear in one hand, your current courage in the other and jump. For me, I wasn't, there was a period in my time in my life, you know, where I wasn't conscious enough to say it so beautifully. It was like, <laughs> all right, I've got this giant bag next to me, but I'm doing it. So the heck with it, you know, I'm going yeah. for it because it, because whatever's out there cannot be as difficult as what's right here. And so that motivated me to get out of uh, the chaos I was in, in any circumstance where I created it again. And, and so that's what I'm talking about being done by your truth. When, re when we resist our truth, for me, that's what I did. I was done by it every single time I resisted my truth. I resisted how dysfunctional the relationships were in my family. I resisted the drug addiction, the all levels of abuse, and so I created it in my personal life. So I drew those kinds of people into my personal life. So I had relationships with people that were not good for me. They were damaging to me. Uh, they were reflections of what I was resisting because what, what we resist, as the saying goes, persists. It is our truth. You know, we can't change our life DNA. We can alter it we can you know play with some epigenetics with our behavior which is what i did on the other side and how i created my success was i was able to in some areas say okay i don't want this i know i can do more i've seen it in nature i know i can do more I, even though there's not a woman in my family that i know that hasn't had drug or alcohol addiction not one i mean i'm like not one and that I can, in my conscious mind, pull up. So I've never seen an example of a woman that's been able to do that. But I knew inherently, just from spending time in nature, that I had more of what I, more than what I had seen in me and more than, and maybe they didn't choose it, but I knew that I could. And so I did. And I knew I needed to surround myself with an, with, with an environment and with uh, influences that told me I could. And so for the longest time, that was just simply nature. It was sitting by a stream and letting the water comfort me, leaning into a tree and feeling the stability and the longevity, which I you know, that stability was the thing I did not have as a kid. I had no, I never knew what was coming next. Mm -hmm. And so people always say, how do you deal with, how did you deal with the unknown? Because my life was constantly instability, which is the unknown, but it's a different kind of unknown. It's an unknown that has this, you know, fear under it, this, you know, holding your breath, this, um, feeling out of control, which we kind of are. I mean, think about it. We're on a planet spinning in space. <laughs> we think we're in control, but are we really? No, we like, we like to think we are, but we're not. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. We're not. You, you mentioned nature a lot. So that's obviously very important to you as it is to me, which I, I love meeting folks like you that nature speaks to your soul, <laughs> you know? Yes. Um, and it's, the stability of it. And I think when, when the world is in chaos and that doesn't even really mean the entire world, that could just be your world, your personal world. I have found over the years for most of my life, being outside, being by Crick, like you had mentioned, walking through a field, listening to the wind blow mm -hmm. through the trees it's always been very, very calming. And I always, even to this day, I say that's, I, I have to be outside every day because that's where I breathe. Yeah. You know, and that's where I, I can feel grounded. Um, it's where I pray. That's where I think it's where ideas come, you know, and it's, it's, it's freeing in a way. So for you and your journey, 
at, at what age did you have this? It was just that, that spark that said, okay, this dysfunction is literally all I know, but it's not all I have to know. Yeah, I think, okay. So first of all, I have to acknowledge that beautiful picture you just painted. That experience of, of allowing the strength and power of nature to support us with the wind, like you said, that going out and allowing it not to be all on our shoulders. That's what I felt when you were speaking was it doesn't always have to be us by ourselves going, leaning and going up against it. Let the wind give you an idea. Let the, the field and the stream and it's, uh, yeah. I, and I think that that is what gave me the idea to answer your question at a young age. Um, I, I can tell you that the day and the, and the experience that made the decision that I was going to leave home and this was, I had to go or I would not survive. I knew, I mean, that's very clear. The first time it was 13 and I ran away the first time. And the next time was 14. And I, uh, and it was, a really intense experience that I had gone through at the house with my stepfather and my mother. And, uh, and I was gone. And then I ended up in a school for what my friend called uh, misfit toys, a school for misfit toys. I was in protective custody. And then I ended up, I said, I'm not going home. And I went um, to the school for about a year, which was an absolute, it was in nature. I, I asked for that, which was great, but it was a mess. There were people there that should not have been teaching. It didn't necessarily uh, help me <laughs> uh, as much as it did just take me away from the environment that I needed a reprieve from. And then at 15, I had a very clear voice say, stop, leave. In a moment when I was, I had no value for my life. I wanted to take it. And it wasn't the first time I had tried to take my life with, with alcohol, with drugs earlier, very young. I would drink until I, till blackout. Um, I did several things that were very harming to myself. It's what I had seen. It's what I had seen practiced around me. These people were all numbing themselves from the pain and trauma they had been through. But at that point, I didn't know. I didn't consciously know what that was. I just, something inside me said, there is more out there than this. And it, I think, Kim, it was there from a very young age because I was considered contentious and I would speak up. And my, I was the one that got in trouble the most because I got in between my sisters and my parents. I just couldn't, you couldn't stop me from saying, you know, no, that's not okay. No matter the consequences. So I would, I have to say that God put it in me and I had uh, a determined nature to keep saying no. <laughs> I love the look on your face. You're like, you're going, okay, this is my sister. Sitting in front of me. That's what I'm like. Are we separated sisters? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you're just describing me there for a few minutes. And I was just sitting here grinning. Oh, goodness. Well, I like how you explained where that voice came from. Sometimes for folks, I think it takes a lot of work to open up your heart and open up your eyes to be able to feel, see, or hear. And then other times that voice just barges its way in because it says enough already. Yeah. Yeah. Enough already, kiddo. Time to open your eyes, time to open your heart, you know, and you said that happened for you at 15. That's young. That's very young. Yeah, it was, I was, well, I think it happened even earlier um, because I knew that what I was experiencing at my house and, you know, and, and mind you, I have a relationship with my, with my family as best as it can be. Um, I love my family. I see much clearer now who they are, what they've been through the night, you know, when I was young. So, um, but I, you know, I, I, that I'm not condoning it. I will always say not cool. And my mom says now it wasn't cool. Thankfully, 
she's growing as a result of my growth too. And as a result of her own courage, you know, it's what happens with us women. And I, I'm sure men do it too, but we, as women, every life comes through us. Do we ever sit with that? You know, the responsibility of that every life, human life comes through us. So when we see harm in the world, when we see men behaving badly, aren't we somehow responsible in some way for not teaching those men that came through us how to treat us properly? Where were we not treating ourselves the best we could? You, you know, and when we when we treat ourselves with a kind of respect and dignity as women, we create the world, a powerful world of men and women. And men, I mean, I've seen men uh, and no men raise an environment like that with women, and it is such a beautiful sight. And and you know, we have to we have to get there again as women, as a, we, we really do have to get there again, where we can courageously say, okay, so I didn't, didn't really handle that as well as I would like. I want to be responsible to my power in this journey, in this life, in this experience, my impact in this world. And that's kind of what happened in me at 15 is I felt so out of control of my own uh, path that I felt didn't belong to my parents completely. I, you know, I felt like, obviously, you know, I'm your child. I recognize that, but I'm not, you don't own me. You don't own me. I'm a, my own energy force, my own life. And if I'm not respecting you, maybe there's a reason for it. I mean, granted, teenagers can be really rough and we all, you know, definitely go through our periods. I'm not saying that we're like perfect because we definitely, especially with all the influences coming out in the world now and coming at our kids, it's a challenge. But I do think it's possible for us to teach respect and dignity by being that ourselves. I think we have to be it. And it's not an easy thing to be. It, you can't be that if you are are not being your truth wholly, meaning if you aren't look, able to look back at all of it that you've been through and say, that's part of me. I don't have to live it every day. I don't have to carry it around like a heavy bag. I don't have to have it dictate my life because my consciousness isn't just that. It's so unlimited and beyond that. But that is my life DNA in this experience. And there's a reason it happened. And I can, I can show what it looks like to go through that and love myself and, and be grateful for this experience anyway. And that's kind of what started happening to me in uh, later in life. I certainly lived in that resistance of that for a long time. My personal relationships were a freaking shit show. <laughs> I mean, it just was. <laughs> Everything was great in work, but it was crazy there. And there were some elements in work that were challenging too, because I was, I was hiding and felt badly. I was compartmentalized apart, compartmentalizing the part of me that I thought I had to judge because I watched everybody around me judging themselves, trying to numb themselves because of judgment, because of not being able themselves to say, that really sucked. And that was really wrong. And I don't want to do that to my kids. And I don't want to do that to myself. How do I do this? How do I walk this? That's what I did. I did that. I was the chain breaker in that. That's the, that's the, the sentence I said to myself. And that was my mission. My mission was to experience love different than what I had experienced and was that my kids would never know what I had lived through. And when I wrote my book and they read it, they were like, oh my gosh, they really didn't know. Right. So I felt like I, I did it. You know, I felt like that was definitely one of my rungs on the ladder that was really important to me. That's pretty powerful. It's pretty darn powerful. At that age, at 15, you know, you were starting out on 
you had told yourself, I'm done. This is it. This is not going to be my normal because it's not normal. How is it that you went from that to into acting? I know. I mean, how'd you, how'd you get there? <laughs> how did you get there? Exactly. It's so, I know. Well, first of all, I would have never in a million years thought that, you know, it's just not what I wanted to do. I didn't have any idea. It wasn't when you're in, in a, in an environment like that, it's rare that you're thinking about, you know, uh, being appreciated for the way that you are creative or being appreciated at all. When you come from abuse, you just don't feel appreciated and seen. So it was a bizarre experience. Um, I had what started it was a photographer approaching me and saying he wanted to take pictures. And I literally thought he was a perv and I basically <laughs> mouthed off to him and said, you know, bleep you, get away from me. You know, because I, you know, I'm thinking I, creeper, creeper, total creeper, <laughs> total creeper. I mean, I, I was in a big city in LA. I, I'd run away and I've been on my own for a year. I just gotten emancipated. This person comes up to me um, and I'm just feeling, and I'm for the first time hanging out with people my own age that were not as, you know, didn't come from this as messed up families as I, as I had these people that, that took me in this family that took me in, they had their own issues, but they were, you know, they were like as normal as I could even imagine. They were super sweet. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is so normal, you know? And, um, they helped me become, uh, the mother helped me become emancipated. She took me in off the street and let me live with her and, uh, and her, her daughter and son and her mother. And she was an angel and I couldn't have, I couldn't have done it without her. I came so close, Kim, to being a statistic. I was literally on the streets. I was in a halfway house in Pacoima, LA and with gang, gang guys. I ran from it with a bag in my hand, a locked house. I could have been easily sold into or taken away. I was just a little girl in many ways. I was tough as nails because I learned that from nature too. And I knew how to, you know, play big, but it was terrifying. So this woman was an angel sent to help me. So this guy approached me and, and, uh, and I said what I said, and uh, <laughs> I'm just going to leave it to your imagination, <laughs> but it wasn't nice. It was like, you know, back the bleep off you perp. And, right. uh, and so, but he persisted. And he lived in the neighborhood and the neighbors knew him. And so when I told Diane about it, she said, well, he's not a bad guy. He actually lives here and he is a photographer. And so maybe you should consider it. And I said, okay, after some convincing, I said, okay, well, I'll go and take pictures, but my friend has to come with me. And so that's what I did. And then he took the pictures to elite model management and the rest just is history. They called me in, they signed me. I met Johnny Casablancas. I ended up going to Italy. I lived there for almost two years. And I did, you know, I signed with an agency over there and I, I worked back and forth from in Italy. I just um, had, you know, just, I just went with it. I moved to Italy at 18 and um, you know, and that was, you know, and that's how it happened. And, and as far as acting very similarly, um, I was modeling and uh, a casting director was calling around modeling agencies, asking for um, uh, any agents that had models that they think were actors more than models. And my agent said, I have a girl. <laughs> She's definitely an actress. She, uh, I call it, my nickname was Chameleon because I, um, I would get so bored with it. First of all, Kim, okay. Standing in front of the camera and I'm not knocking modeling. I think it's great. All the people love it, but it wasn't my jam. I was like, I'm standing here. How many times can I like do this? You right. know, you're seeing me. And it's like, what is so interesting about this? <laughs> the best part of it was traveling the actual work. I don't know. It just bored the crap out of me. So um, <laughs> it just did, you know? And so I would turn my, I would turn the shoots into like little like scenes so every time, you know, those stories. So right. every time I did a shoot, I looked so different because I would be feeling different. And so my agent was like, you have like your books, like a chameleon. It's like, it's, you know, 
you know, it's not like I, you fit into one category. It's like, I can, you know, she goes, which is easy and difficult. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so that's, and so I ended up going into that casting and it was my first audition and it was with Billy Crystal first with the casting director. And then she called me back and it was with Billy Kip, Crystal, Bruno Kirby and Ron Underwood. And we just improvised, which is what I had been doing my whole life. Right. I had been doing it my whole life. I've been improvising my life. I would go out and I bet you can relate to this. When you were walking in nature, how much do you talk? All the time. <laughs> <laughs> I have so many stories. <laughs> I have so many stories that and it, they just come in a rush and of wood sprites and fairies that live <laughs> just around that tree. You can't see them because they're awful slick and wily about it. But I have all these stories and a lot of them I've written down or I will talk them into my phone, you know, because I'm like, oh, oh, converse, full conversations, what the characters look like, what they sound like, the accents that they have, the kind of clothes that they wear, you know, like the one little wood sprite, she always wears a mushroom cap for a hat. I mean, and she's just the most adorable little thing. And she's always there. <laughs> I'm so with you on that. Oh my gosh. I do the same thing. I have pictures of little, par a little, like little caves. Like, you know how when um, moss grows and it creates a little dark hole, that's a whole world in there. It is a whole world in there. <laughs> yes. And when I was in I Germany, met my soul sister. Exactly. You have to met your soul sister. I'm a, this is going to make you laugh so hard. Okay. So I was doing a series in Germany and I, and I got to go to East Germany and, and in the, this is in the nineties and it was still really different. I mean, really different. You went out into the woods and there was so much foliage on the ground that when the horses were walking, it they sunk up to their hocks. And it was just like, and when we walked, I was like, I gotta feel this, you know? So I jump off and it's just like spongy because it was so untouched. Yeah. So I came up with this story of Herman the Hutt from Half Banawatch. <laughs> awesome. And it, it, I know. And it came from this picture that um, at the barn that the, uh, the family had. And it was like a mixture of, it had horns from some creature. It had feathers. It had fur. It had all this. And it looked like, you know, like the headpiece that the wise, you know, leader of some creature would wear. And so it just popped into my head and I have a story. I, I have the same thing. I have stories written down and things that I've, I've been doing that. And that was part of the reason why when Lisa said, you know, write a, you know, consider writing a book. I was like, write a book. Oh, wow. I've written scripts. I've written little stories. I've written poems. But I hadn't thought about, you know, and I was like, well, wait, you've been writing your whole life. Why don't you do this? Just your topic's going to be a little bit different. It's going to be coming from you know, the areas you don't really want to talk about, but this is going to be, this is, you're hearing this, you're hearing this Walker. So that means you need to do something with it. Right. As soon as yeah. you said you're hearing this, I knew exactly what you meant. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. That's been my whole life. So I took, I, I tend when I hear it, I take action. And a lot of people hear it and whatever it is to them. I, I'm a person of faith, so I know where that whisper's coming from for me personally. And so, but I didn't always listen mm. and I didn't always follow because it was that like what you had said, and I can't remember your exact words, so I'll, I'll just use my own. For me, I stuff stuff down. Mm. You just stuff it down. You just keep cramming it and cramming it because you have to wear that mask outside. You can't let people know what's going on. Mm you know, maybe behind closed doors or within your own self because of something happened, you know, what have you can't let others know or others see, oh, God forbid you let others see the ugliness of you, mm -hmm. what you perceive to be ugly because of what others have done or said. It took me a long time. I, I think I've always heard that. I just never listened. Mm -hmm. How was that for you? Do you, because you had mentioned you said I was like that my whole life. 
So to me, tell me if I'm wrong. It sounded like you were saying, yeah, you heard that your whole life, but you never really listened. Oh yeah. Are you kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I had those earmuffs on and I was holding them down with my hands. <laughs> Another good visual. Another good visual. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, definitely. I know the the loudest whisper in my life has been, you have nothing to be ashamed of. You have nothing to be afraid of. Everything you've been through is meant to be. And how about this? What if you chose it? Because if you chose it and you accept it, how is that energy going to help the person? that doesn't know they have that ability, that they have that choice for them too. Yes. And, exactly. and the facts are, I mean, like I said, it's life DNA. You can't go back and change it. So why not accept what is? It's the, it's, you know, it may not be easy in the moment, but the reason it's not easy in the moment is because you just haven't learned that it's easy in the moment. That's the only reason it's not easy is because all these you know, perceptions and all these influences saying, oh, it's not easy. You can't. That what was, you know, before you we took in all that, in all those impressions, all those perspectives, all those judgments, what were we? We were an open receiving vessel that said yes to just about everything as a child. We we right. said yes, let's play. Let's go towards what we don't know because that's where life is and adventure is. Right. The awe. The awe. Oh, the awe is everything. I, the awe, awe of it. it. And I just, it's the awe when we're, we lose that awe. We don't see the world with those eyes anymore because like you said, all of these outside forces and people and what have you is just slamming all this other stuff in front of us. It's a battle every day. Yeah, to streets. try and to find the awe and to keep that awe and wonder about the world around you. Because we are surrounded by amazingly good stuff and beautiful things. Oh my gosh. I mean, you just nailed it. The awe and the wonder is the secret of life. Because when you allow yourself, and, and you know what? If you can put yourself in that position mentally. And in my book, you, I, if you read it, the, I talk about the awe state and the value of it. I have an awe state exercise in there. You put yourself in that place. If it means you lay on the ground like a baby does and look at the blades of grass, if it means you lay on your back and put yourself in, in the uh, happy baby pose, yoga pose, and, and see your feet and your hands for the first time in a long time and be in awe and wonder of these incredible gifts that do so much for you every day. Wiggle your toes, wriggle, wiggle, wriggle your fingers and really look at your hands. Babies will do that in the crib for hours, <laughs> yeah. hours. They will just stare at, there's nothing about their body that they aren't in absolute awe and wonder, including their own poop. All right. of it's like, Wow. Yes, everything. It's all amazing. It's <laughs> all amazing. Exactly. You know, and it's funny because it's so important for us to put ourselves there because we do, we forget that. And that's what I, why I included that beautiful quote from Jesus about the kingdom of God belongs to the children, because I believe that that's how we see God truthfully. And that never ends within us, that awe state. And that is discovering yourself through the light of your innocence. That's what the subtitle of my book is about. That's what that, that statement is. The light of your innocence is that when you're a child, you are in pure innocence. It is a light that is beaming out of you. It never goes away. It just gets life piled on it and we can peel it off. And sometimes it just takes a physical action. Imagine the baby and the position that makes you feel that warm smile that makes the corners of your eyes crease, your mouth and that warm, you literally feel like Santa because there's like rosiness coming into your cheeks because of the <laughs> smile. And put yourself into that place physically and let yourself be in wonder. If it's a seat in nature, if it's a seat in your home and it's just appreciating your body, your eyes, your 
whatever it is, a piece of you, your, your index finger knuckle, whatever, take a moment, go there and, and, and really be in, in connection with your magnificence, because that's what our innocence is. It is our magnificence and babies give us a free license, a, yeah. a movie of it every day. Yeah. They're there to teach us. They show us. And even if we haven't had children, they're everywhere, and we <laughs> yeah. it, you know? And the most important one is inside of you. It's right there. Absolutely. And all the lessons you need come from yeah. that innocence. We all have it. None of us, no matter what we've been through, that light does not go away. No, nope. It just simply gets covered and we can uncover it. Yeah. And, you know, putting yourself in an environment with people or just if, if, if there are people you feel safe with, great. But if there's not, there is always nature there that will help you release and unpeel those, you know, tarps <laughs> and, <laughs> you know, and, you know, wet blankets and whatever that you put over there, uh, over it, over your light, they, it is available to you. I have done it more times just leaning into a tree. Yep. Just letting the tree, you know, you've been here for hundreds of years, like, when people ask me who I want to talk to, if I could talk to anybody in the world, it's always a giant sequoia for me. It's always a giant sequoia. I want to talk to a giant oak. Yeah. Okay. Well, there you go. <laughs> See? Well, sister. Yep. Yeah. You know, because I want to, there's something, there, there's been such a gift I've been given by trees in my life, leaning in and feeling safe and, and knowing that I can literally go to those places. I could lean in and spend the, an hour weeping and talking to the tree and letting it go through my back. And I know the tree is receiving it. I know the tree's taking it and without any burden. Right. No burden. I'm not burdening that tree. The tree wants it because the tree knows how, is wiser than me, knows how to transmute it. I trust the tree. And that's, I think, another huge obstacle that people have been through the things, some of the things that you and I have been through. And, you know, if there's anyone out there who needs to hear this, because you don't trust doesn't mean you can't heal. I still deal with my trust issue. Trust has been the biggest hurdle for me in my life, the most challenging. I look at it every day. And I consciously say, look, you're not your thoughts. You're your consciousness. It's unlimited. It's your thoughts and your experiences and your perceptions and the influences that make you think that you can never trust and that there's something else. It's a shoe that's going to drop or something. So I go through those thoughts and then I let them go. And I say, it's okay to trust. Just take a baby step towards trust. Just allow that there's a possibility that what you think may happen may not. Just allow it. Just a little bit of possibility there. We are and, our own worst enemies, I think. And we, we certainly do, can be. When you start having these, these negative thoughts and then they take shape and then they grow bigger when they don't need to. Yeah. You know, there, there are days with the whole trust thing, you know, and I'll sit there and you just have days, you know, sometimes you just have off days <clears throat> and I often think, wow, Kim, you just did that to yourself. You just, you just put yourself in that mood on purpose for the last hour or two hours or whatever it may have been. And I'm like, Kim, what are you doing? Grab the dog and go for a walk. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Get your butt outside. <laughs> and that's, that's what I, and I've done that. I've, you know, said to myself, Kim, wait, you, you just did that to yourself. Come on now. That's a hard one. And it's a, it's a learning thing. And, you know, and I think it's a daily thing, no, I do. Matter, no matter what stage of life you're in. No question, because we're in this experience, right? And right. everything around us often says the opposite. 
So we have to have that conversation with ourselves. We have to say, you know, like one of my favorite quotes is, next time you want to say he, she, or it did it, did that to me, say I did that to me and see how you feel. And it's in my, it's in Awaken. I wrote, I wrote it down and uh, it's the very beginning because it had such an impact on me when I heard it. It, again, it brings us to our responsibility to be our own first caretaker and through responsibility and caretaking of ourselves, we, we impact the world with that energy. We change this experience, this world, one person at a time, and then collectively because that energy draws like energy mm -hmm. that's why it's so important to just start the conversation it doesn't have to be you know don't get yourself in intellectualized into you know you got to have the answer it's got to be you know two plus two equals four no it, you it takes a minute you got to find what your pluses are and what your equals is first by taking that first step what am I putting together? What do I want it to the result to be? And be okay with those baby steps. That's why, again, I think it's so important to allow yourself to go to that place inside of you that is, is in your innocence and is connected to that awe and wonder of the child. Because when you go there, you're going to find it really hard to judge yourself, to be hard on yourself. I agree. I agree. There was a uh... I held a writing contest a little over a year ago <clears throat> and I just tossed it out there in social media saying, Hey, I'm going to have this writing contest. And in 500 words or less, I want you to write a letter to your five-year-old self. Mm -hmm. I didn't say any type of theme or topic or anything. Just write a letter to your five-year-old self. The response was amazing. Every story brought me to tears, some because I was laughing, some because it was just heart wrenching, but every one of them was going back and telling their five-year-old self, life is going to be so hard or you're, you're going to be hurt, but you make it. And I'm waiting on the other side for you. Every story was in that vein. I didn't ask for that, but every story was like that. And I remember thinking the way we talk to ourselves, go back and talk exactly like that. All those nasty words that you use, that you tell yourself every day, go back and tell your five-year-old self that, can you do that? Yeah. Could you, if you have children, could you use those words against your own child? I know I couldn't the yeah. way I talk to myself sometimes. So yeah, I like, I like how you shared, how you shared what you just shared, which I just said the word shared four times in like four seconds, but <laughs> I'm being somewhat redundant. But <laughs> <laughs> no, I love it because it is sharing. That's what's happening right here. I hope you, did you put all those together? You, that needs to be a book. I, I did not have permission to do that. Oh. And that was perfectly fine. They, they were not shared people on their own, if they personally wanted to share them, but I did give like little badges mm, okay. for first, second, third. It was so hard to even choose, but, um, it was, it was an amazing exercise, but it was also a big learning experience for me too. Cause I was like every single person that wrote a story went that direction yeah. about, they didn't go into detail of what they'd went through or traumas or anything that they'd experienced but they were telling their five-year-old self, boy, it's going to be a bumpy ride and it's going to hurt, but look at, we're here. We made it. And I'm going to be waiting for you. I mean, it was just, oh, it was so cool. Yeah. It's well, I, I imagine you drew that because, you know, I love that. I got you. And, and I definitely have that. That's been part of my healing is I had to go through each period that was the, had the most trauma. And for me, it was three and it was 11, 12, 14, 15, those. And then, you know, I, I went through some challenges in my, in my young adult life too, from, as we spoke about at the beginning, resisting my life DNA and drawing it to me, 
reliving some of the abuse and realizing, okay, there's a lesson I need to learn here so I can move past this. It's so important for us to go back and be that loving parent to that part of ourselves. Each experience that might be living, doing us, doing us, each part of our life DNA truth that is doing us, that we're not allowing ourselves to be in acceptance of. That's how you move it from it being done to you to it being a part of being your truth is you find acceptance with it. And the road to acceptance with it is being that caring, loving parent to that part of yourself that needs to see you on the other side, arms wide open, that they can run into your arms and you hold that part of you with that parent that, that lives in you. That yes. Exactly. I mean, the exponential quantum healing that happens from giving yourself that is hard to put into words, but it's real. It's real. I've been it. I've lived it. it I couldn't have created the success in my life personally and professionally without that step. And it's not as hard as you may think when you're on the other side of it. You know, anyone who's listening who thinks, oh, I can't do that. No, you can do that because yes, that's yes. in you. Yep, I agree. And on that note, we're going to get ready to wrap up. I could keep talking for a really long time. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. Me too. I have all kinds of stuff going on in my head that I could talk about and ask, but we are going to get ready to wrap up. Thank you. First off, thank you so much for being my guest. It's just so fun to meet. Well, obviously a sister that I never knew I had. Exactly. <laughs> so nice to meet you. Thank you. Finally. Yeah. Yeah, finally. <laughs> Where have you been? <laughs> uh, <laughs> but this is this has been an awesome conversation. But so while you while I've still got you with me, share with the listeners where they can find more about you. Okay, well, they can go on to my link tree, which I gave to you. So you can, uh, if you, if you'll add that, go to my link tree, everything's there. Or they can go on Walker, uh, my website, walkerbrand.com. Super easy. But uh, there's a lot more information on the link tree. I love that because I can put everything there. And, and all of that will be in the show notes, folks. So you will be able to click right on that. And it'll take you right to all of that stuff on her link tree link. I ask all of my guests before we say goodbye for the day, I ask all of my guests if they would toss a nugget of hope out there to the listeners, just something that they can tuck away in their pocket and carry with them for the rest of the day. So if you could please share a nugget of hope. There is no opinion about you that matters more than your own. That to me is if, Throughout your day, when you feel yourself making somebody else's opinion more important than your own, no matter what the topic is, consider taking a moment and being true to your opinion of yourself, of what you want, and let your life DNA be of your own choosing. Very nice. Very nice. I like that. That's a good little nugget of hope. And I hope that some of those folks out there listening right now, I hope you caught it. I hope you caught that. And if not, hit pause, rewind, listen to it again. <laughs> yes. Yes. I'm going to practice it today. I'm going to remember all day long that my opinion of myself. You know, me. someone just said that I think this was a post on social media the other day um, saying when someone's throwing their their opinion at you how do you react <clears throat> and i just said i smile and then do what i'm going to do anyway because i cannot let others insecurities land on me i love that and when someone's throwing you know their dark opinion trying to argue you into changing your mind like no that's your insecurity not mine it's true and and you know what when that happens another thing that that will, will help ease that as well is we draw the reflections. So when somebody, somebody does that, it's an opportunity. This isn't, wow, this is an opportunity for me to value myself. 
that's how I look at it. This is an opportunity because right now I'm feeling like that person may not value me. What is that that I need to value in myself more so I don't draw this reflection? I need to practice it more. That means I need to be all about my own wonder more. Because <laughs> All about really my own wonder. That's awesome. I need to put my cape on. That's right. <laughs> my cape on today, Kim. <laughs> And I want to see you in yours. And I want all your <laughs> listeners to put their capes on today and let's fly together. I I have a Miss America outfit with the shield, knee high, mid thigh, actually, red patent leather boots. Oh my. There's a local photographer who approached me one time and said, I'm getting women together and I want them to dress up as who they feel their superhero is. And he ended up getting 12 of us. I'm a veteran. So I chose what I chose on purpose. That just it fit me. Um, but others made up their own costumes for their own superheroes. There was a lady who was battling cancer at the time and sadly succumbed to it after, but it was after the photo shoot was done. And he, he published this and he got all kinds of accolades for it because it was just ordinary folks dressing up as their superhero and becoming them and the reasons why. So that's oh, what I'm like, I need my cape or I need my shield, you know, Captain America's shield that he holds out. I got one. <laughs> you know? Oh, I definitely, can I, can you send me the picture please? <laughs> Cause yes. I want to see this. I yes. Love that. It was, it was probably for... one of the funnest things I've done, but it was also cause we had to write our story to go along with the picture. He took the pictures, but then we had to write the story of why we chose that superhero to be that superhero mine is wonder woman always was wonder woman it was bionic woman when i was younger and then it was wonder woman she wasn't bionic wasn't really like a superhero but wonder woman it was wonder woman because i don't know about you kim but i thought she was badass oh i absolutely <laughs> loved her you know those, those big old bracelets that she could just block everything like, coming at her <laughs> and the and the funny one of the funniest parts was she's up in the sky flying her invisible plane, but you could see her. <laughs> I, love, I loved Wonder Woman. I did too. So yeah, that would be mine. You know, I love wonder. It's like wonder is such a big part of my life. So definitely Wonder Woman, but I want to see that picture. Please send it to me. I will. Uh, I will. There's, he did a whole shoot. So I'll, I'll, I'll see. Yeah. I'll pick a couple and send them to you. He approached 12 different women mm. to do this. And it was just Real, and he said that it was just, it was a profound experience for him as well as a, just as a human being. And as a man, no doubt. Yes, it was, uh, it was awesome. It was awesome. We are, we are our own superheroes. Darn right. We are. We have to be. And so I said, I'm going to go get my cape. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you again for your service. By the way, I'm such a, uh, uh, veteran supporter. I, I just. Bless you for your service. Oh, my whole welcome. life I've been. You are welcome. All right. Well, hey, folks, we're actually, we actually are going to wrap up this episode of Let Fear Bounce. Yes, we are. <laughs> now we're going to go. We have a day. We have plans. We have wonder to experience. We That's right. There's on. all in wonder out there to experience. Now get out there and do it. That's all right. That's all right. <laughs> all right. Thank you once again, Walker, for being my guest. This has been an absolute pleasure. Everybody out there listening, I hope you enjoyed this episode as much as I did having Walker as my guest. So everybody out there, be well, stay well, and be blessed. And until next time, this is Kim Langling, your host of Let Fear Bounce. And that is a wrap, my fearless friends. Thanks for bouncing along with me on another episode of Let Fear Bounce. I hope you're feeling a bit motivated and ready to take on any challenge that might come your way in the coming days. Be sure to hit that subscribe button so you never miss an episode of Let Fear Bounce. Tune in each week for your dose of inspiration from my amazing guests from all over the world. So until next time, keep bouncing forward and stay fearless, my friends. Everybody be well, stay well, and above all, be blessed. Mm -hmm.